Thanks for the great questions from the audience so far. This has been a wonderful discussion. I do really want to encourage everyone to read the paper, not just, not just because we tried so hard to write it, but because um, I think there are, I'm hearing a lot of questions that are about this larger critique of, um, of mixed-use development as, as kind of like a mega-scale product that's really hot right now and that people are talking a lot about. And one of the reasons why we wrote this paper is to help distinguish catalytic development as a model from this bigger, just mixed use, walkable urban as a product that's out there now. And so this is something we get into in really great detail in the paper, like how to tell the difference between a uh, northern white rhino and a southern white rhino. And um, uh, so uh, this has been a great conversation so far. And let's just jump right in. I have here with me um, Chris Crimmins, who is a vice president partner in the Chattanooga Land Company now, but who had a previous life as an executive at the River City Company, who is the subject of our paper. And Bob Gregory, who is chief planning and public space officer with the Downtown Detroit Partnership and is the dad of Campus Martius. <laughs> and Steve Leeper, president and CEO of the Cincinnati Center City Development Corporation and all around resident badass. So. <laughs> So let's get started. Um, what I want to talk about with you guys today first is um, those are some great questions from the audience right now. And I kind of felt some energy coming from you guys. Were there any questions that were asked so far that you would like to discuss in the context of your communities? One of the, I would start off with that. One of the things in Chattanooga's case was, I think, our history, thanks to Chris Leinberger's great work that began with us in the mid 1980s, was uh, a public, uh, a public planning process that started with uh, a grassroots effort called Vision 2000 that was totally open to the public, that was grassroots oriented, that began to create and set a whole new agenda and vision for our community uh, by all manner of citizens on a whole range of topics. And that was really the genesis of uh, how our whole process began. An inclusive vision. Absolutely. Totally inclusive. And guys, anything that you heard asked so uh, far that you're just burning just to talk about? Cases, a couple things. Um, one is the question about taxes. We're a 501c3, but we pay property taxes on our holdings. Uh, we pay, because uh, I know I'm making a case to the city about this, but is it? Is it? I, I'm not it's just like a little it. muffled by your shirt. There you go. How's that? Yeah. Better? Yeah. We pay about a million dollars a year in property taxes on our holdings. And then uh, it is discussed about, um, you know, do we have local tenants um, in, over the Rhine, especially, and really downtown, true. Is, is true as well, but we have virtually all local tenants, and most of them are first-generation businesses. And I was, I was laughing, because of, uh, Tracy, that the reason I want to be so altruistic, but the fact is, is that no national tenants would come to Over the Run. <laughs> <laughs> now that's changed, but when we and when, now that we're changed and we're having some success, we we still don't want. It. So I, it's sort of we we got forced into that corner, and we're glad we did. And Steve, is that also um, is it also advantageous to work with local tenants because you have profit sharing agreements in your leases? Yeah, the way we do it is uh, we renovate property, mixed use, commercial, residential, commercial upstairs, retail on the first floor. We renovate the property, we hold the asset, we white box it. They contribute some TI money, we contribute the TI money, and it's we watch their bottom line. It's it's either $15 a square foot or 6% of your gross, whichever's higher. And virtually everybody is paying 6% of the gross. And some of our restaurant tenants are paying almost $100 a square foot. Now, we, now, we build our, our spaces for Tuesday in February, not for Easter Sunday service. So we're small, very tight, 1,200, 2,000 square feet. Um, and we think that's been uh, part of our success. And just to decode that for everybody here, TI stands for tenant improvement. And it's basically like if you're going to move into a commercial space and you're a restaurant, for example, you would need it to have a commercial kitchen for you to cook out of. But you as a person starting a restaurant don't necessarily have $50,000 just lying around to build a kitchen. So usually there's a, an arrangement that's in. And this, you could apply the same thing to a bookstore. There are things that you need inside your space to fit it out to run your kind of retail. And so usually this is an arrangement between the landlord and the tenant. Um, and I think something that distinguishes um, catalytic developers in terms of operating in the mixed use space and some of the other developments that you may see unfolding in your communities is this real ability to do the commercial side of mixed use because anyone can build a building and just put spaces on the first floor. 
whether those spaces can actually be made to work for retail tenants is a totally different story. Okay, so we just talked about local businesses and commercial real estate, but I want to ask you guys about open space because in Chattanooga, Detroit, and Cincinnati, we have seen really astounding and transformational investments in high quality public open space that, um, that, doesn't, that doesn't directly serve a, a cash paying tenant. And we're talking about, you know, not just, a, not just a small investment here, but many, many millions of dollars and put in up front at the beginning of your processes. Why? Why high quality open space? And, and, and why spend so much money on it? Chris? In Chattanooga's case, uh, when we began in the mid-1980s, it was, we have a beautiful natural resource flowing through our city called the Tennessee River. And for generations, we had turned our back on that. And so when we went through this public planning process, one of the major themes that emerged was the reappreciation and renewed public access back to the water's edge. So that was one of the major themes was public space, both along the water's edge and then where the city meets the river, that we should have world-class public spaces for all citizens and visitors to enjoy to appreciate the natural beauty of the city. So, that so was it's, just, the, it's just nice. That was one of the early guiding principles. Okay. It's nice and it's, and it's what the community wanted. Absolutely. All right. Bob, what about Detroit? So in Detroit, I mean, it's a story of, of decades of decline. I think as Chris mentioned, I mean, 30, 40 years. And we, had a beautiful, we have a beautiful river, the Detroit River. And back in the 70s, Ford Motor Company decided they're going to build a Renaissance Center on the river, but isolate it from everything else downtown from the heart of the city, actually from the heart of the river as well. So that failed in many ways. And so the core of downtown Detroit, which at one point had 150,000 people working in it, has almost as much retail, second to Manhattan, I think, in terms of the amount of retail there, all of that left, decades of it all leaving to the point where we had 50,000 people working downtown. All the retail is empty. All the restaurants were gone. And we had this, 1997, we did a plan, uh, the Forerunner Downtown Trade Partnership did a plan to revitalize the core centered on public space. We take our Main Street Woodward Avenue, which runs right th up and down through the, from the river up, up 30 miles. We put, put a public space there. And then in 2000, uh, one of our key leaders at the time, business leaders, Pete Carmanos, decided he'd move his company downtown, 4,000 uh, tech, tech technology folks, uh, into downtown only if this public space got developed. It was a but for public space. I'll bring my 4,000 people down, $400 million in, in, a, in a million square foot mixed use project. So that kind of started it. Without the public space, uh, the development down in the core of downtown would not have started. It was a critical for economic development and social transformation. In, in our case, uh, civic spaces are a fundamental priority for us. It's not only redeveloping civic spaces, but it's managing them thereafter. And, and we identified so far today three spaces. Uh, it's about 14 acres between the uh, uh, prime uh, central space in, in Cincinnati, which is Fountain Square, WKRP, if you remember, <laughs> and um, Washington Park, which is an overrun, and Ziegler Park. We've invested about $140 million in those three spaces that the, we, that the 3CDC did on behalf of the city with some city money, but also um, primarily private money. In Fountain Square, it's about, of the 48 million, about 44 million of it was private. Um, all of it had a parking component. Um, all of it is management of both the civic space and the parking together. Um, the, the spaces themselves, um, we operate on behalf of the city and we operate at a budget of about $6 million, $7 million a year for those spaces, keeping them clean, safe, and programmed. And it's a nice amenity to have, but the reason you do it is because, um, one, in the case of uh, Washington Park, it is essentially a neighborhood park, um, but also it is a very much a stimulus for driving people into downtown, driving people into over the Rhine, increasing real estate um, uh, prices around it, and it really is a, a safe haven for many children in the neighborhood. Thanks for that, Steve. Okay, and um, so Steve, as you mentioned, it's not just about creating high quality open space, but also managing it. Can you guys talk about um, what are the most successful placemaking strategies that you've used in your community? What's working for you to activate these spaces? Well, first of all, one of the great things is on the front end is having the right planning and having the right input on the front end so that when we open them and dedicate them, 
and then having the right sort of programming uh, elements coming in to run them and operate them and having the entity to oversee that over time. I think River City's uh, role since its inception since the uh, uh, mid-1980s has been to oversee and plan and program these spaces for years. And so that's uh, continued for several decades. And what is River City doing with the spaces? Uh, they oversee the animation of those spaces and uh, the programming of them. What kind of events do you guys do? Uh, everything from uh, music festivals that bring in 100,000 people a night along the riverfront to very small venues. and It just depends upon the size of the venue and the appropriate um, scale, whether it's in the middle of the center city in the center business district or on the waterfront. Uh, it's, a, it's a whole range of size of uh, animation activities depending upon the place. Bob? Well, I, I think it's, it's a lot of things. The vision up front, making sure you have the spaces are in the right places. You can create new spaces, renovate old spaces. The, having the vision for a very flexible programming. I think you need a beautiful space. You need uh, the ability to do all kinds of programming. We do year-round programming. Like Steve and I, we're, we're managing almost seven spaces now, including a brand new space that one of our power companies, ET Energy, just opened last year. So you have to have year-round programming. It has to be inclusive. It has to be diverse. It has to you know, appeal to many demographics. and. Uh, and you need to really market that and really work with the media and PR in your town to really make sure people want to come to it, they know about it. It's, you know, it's, it's all free programming, it's all privately funded. Uh, and again, much like Steve's organization, you know, we invested in, initially in Campus March, it's about $20 million uh, and about $2 million annually. Now we have seven spaces that are around $5 million in terms of programming and maintenance and, and activation that, uh, that, are, that we're doing, so. But Bob, why a beach in downtown Detroit? <laughs> Why a beach? Well, you got to, so I mean, we do have a, a pop-up urban beach in Campus Marshes Park, and that we did that five years ago. This is our sixth year in doing it, and really, we just had a, a, a space that was kind of in, even in Campus Marshes, which is probably the busiest space in, in, in Michigan right now. Uh, we had a space that was kind of underutilized, and we were look, always looking to innovate every year and not keep doing the same thing every year, no matter what space we're working in. So. So we had this idea for, for a pop-up beach, and we worked with a project for public spaces who saw the, the Paris Plage along the Seine there. And we said, let's do a small version of that. And we, we now have a, a, a container restaurant on it, a bar there, a deck. We do all kinds of programming on the little beach in terms of family, daycare, games, music, Friday nights. There's so much going on, on that little beach. It's now next to our ice rink in the wintertime. It's the most popular thing we do. I heard that kiosk sells $600,000 worth of beer a year. Uh, prob probably more than that. Steve, we're, we're trying to keep up with Steve in terms of his beer sales, yeah. but yeah, it yeah. does a lot. And Steve, it, tell us more about your that, beer sales. 6% of that goes back to fun. So. Well, we, we have three spaces, um, Fountain Square and Washington Park. We virtually program every night uh, between May 1st until the, almost the end of October. Um, and then, of course, in Fountain Square in the winter, then we bring in our skating rink. So we... You know, a program space is an active, is a safe space, is a productive space. Um, and we try to make it very diverse. Um, the, the music genre will change. We hire people that know what they're doing in that field to program that space. And, um, and we spend, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year on talent. Um, Ziegler Park, which we just opened last summer, uh, and this is the first full year, is a more active space. It's basketball courts. We built... Uh, and in an urban area, we built a full-size 25-meter uh, swimming pool. And in the African-American community, swimming is a challenge. Young kids aren't learning to swim anymore. And rather than uh, close the old park the pool that never, no one ever swam in before, we said, we're not going to eliminate a pool. We're actually going to build a bigger one. And we're going to recruit. And um, we, uh, here's uh, good news. Um, we had uh, 50 kids sign up for the, for the um, Over the Rhine Rhinos swim team. <laughs> we, had, uh, we had about 45 kids sign up for swim lessons. Some of the kids that are swim lessons are actually on the swim team, so I'm not so sure how well our record's going to be this year. <laughs> but nonetheless... Uh, and it's a moral victory. And then tomorrow, tomorrow Tuesday, uh, we actually start our eight-week... Uh, Full summer camp for kids. 80 kids will come uh, at Ziegler Park, and we partner with a not-for-profit that actually works in the community to provide what I think will be a great um, haven for kids during the summer. So uh, it's a total, you know, our programming is uh, very diverse between the, the spaces, and certainly I think in the case of Ziegler Park, 
has really hit home to the neighborhood that this is a, a place for them. Okay, sign me up for Rhino's t-shirt. <laughs> oh, by the way, it is a great logo. Somebody donated the logo and it's fantastic. I can't wait. Go to the Ziegler Park uh, website, you'll see it. Okay, um, you guys are all using the words diversity and inclusion, but I think we need to interrogate that a little bit. What do those words mean to you and what do they mean in your community? Be more specific. I think in Chattanooga's case, it means on any topic range, ranging from public art to what might happen with the future of the riverfront. Uh, we have developed a public process that's totally open and transparent to the public when we undertake large scale projects. It's sort of become informally known as the Chattanooga Way, where uh, uh, in any sort of major project we undertake or civic endeavor, we'll, we'll host a whole series of public meetings open to anyone and everyone to uh, gather and uh, take down uh, all manner of input from whoever wants to raise their hand. Can you give me an example of how input from those meetings has shaped a process? Absolutely. The, it, going back to the mid-1980s, uh, I remember it was a very novel process at the time to, to put the future of your community out to a public forum process. And I remember I was uh, in my early 20s and was attending these in the mid-1980s, and a lady raised her hand and said, well, gosh, uh, could we save the Tivoli Theater, which was a beautiful 1920 Beaux-Arts style theater that was possibly going to be torn down. And you know, by her raising her hand, encouraged others to raise their hand and said, yeah, that's a beautiful place. God, I didn't realize it was going to be torn down. We need to save that. And that was one of the early first projects that the River City Company and the city worked on was the saving and restoring the Tivoli Theater. So just by the fact someone could come to these processes and these open meetings and raise their hand and speak their mind about what was deeply important to them about Chattanooga and its history and where it could go, that led to that project being saved as one of the early projects. That's just one example of many, many. Uh, but but that, that whole process has sort of become known as the Chattanooga Way. I remember former Mayor Bob Corker, now a U.S. Senator, was amazed he was going to take on a public art project. And he said, we'll have a meeting at 730 in the morning. And 500 people showed up. You know, it was like, wow, you know, this is amazing. 500 people show up for a meeting about public art at 730 in the morning. So it's a very powerful process for our community. Cool. Bob, what about in Detroit? What does diversity and inclusion mean? So that's a tough question, I mean, Tracy, because you have a in any city, but in Detroit, you have a metropolitan area that's over four and a half million people and maybe isn't as diverse as you would think it is, but the city of Detroit has got about 750,000 people, of which 80% of them are African Americans. So how you answer that question is, it can be probably a whole session on this. But I mean, for us, I mean, in the public spaces, it means, I mean, when we started doing these public spaces back in 2004, we opened Campus Marshes, you know, we hired a whole team of people to do all the programming. Uh, headed by an African-American woman. So it wasn't just about, let's just find ways to make diverse music, or diverse entertainment. We hired the people, you know, who has a whole, her whole team is African-American. So and we've had that ever since we started this thing 15 years ago. So, so we're looking at inclusion, not just saying we're going to be diverse. We hired the people that actually are diverse to help us create the programming. And, and I think, again, that having community engagement, stakeholder engagement all along the way, any new project we start, there's always community engagement. It continues throughout the whole process. And, 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 and not if we're going to design something, build something, operate something, we keep that going. So I think you have to have that input all along the way. And Steve, what about Cincinnati? Well, obviously, you know, we were formed in 2004, three, and really was in, in direct response to, you know, the racial unrest and the incident that we had in over the Rhine. Um, so tensions were high. And, um, People, uh, I think, forgot the, how to talk about the subject of race. And um, I think taking that subject head on, um, and when you spend a, a 1.3 billion as we have over the last 14 years, the issue of gentrification is clearly going to be on the table. And it's, it's going to be the first question that's going to be asked. So um, look, we had, we've, we've uh, addressed it in multiple ways, sometimes successfully, sometimes we can always do a better job and need to do some soul searching there. But in terms of affordable housing, you know, what was wild about what happened is that w when we went into Over the Rhine, the State Housing Finance Agency, which controls the, the uh, allocation of low-income tax credits, 
wouldn't put any more tax credits in over the Rhine because it had been uh, uh, too dense uh, uh, of credits already there, and that they uh, fact that it was an impacted neighborhood. So they cut, cut, cut us off. Well, who the hell impacted them? The, uh, the state housing finance agency. So we pushed back and were able to begin getting affordable housing, quality affordable housing. And, and, and then there's a whole range. When we speak about affordable housing, there's not just low income and workforce, there's special needs housing, which is very much a, a need in our neighborhood, uh, particularly for those who that are either homeless, soon to be homeless. And we built three comprehensive and residential service facilities for the homeless, spent over $42 million doing it. And we are also working in the whole area of, of uh, permanent supportive housing and, um, and uh, housing for other special needs. So uh, it, in the housing area, I think we've made some inroads in terms of the enterprises in the commercial districts. As I indicated, we don't really have national chains. About 23% of them are minority-owned businesses. Many of them were first-time businesses. If you add women to that inclusive category, it's about half. Um, so um, we do things to protect them, make sure that in times of good times that we're there for them, and in bad times we're there for them as well. And then, of course, in the in the programming and, and employment are important too. We um, in all the areas that we manage, rather than buying that service from a third party, we employ people directly. We have full-time employees, about 17, 18 full-time field workers, and about 100 part-time field workers. The full-time field workers. We pay 100% of their medical benefits. We pay them a, a very competitive and livable wage, and we pay them a 403B program. And those number of employing full-time employee um, from job readiness programs are increasing. So um, we're doing some things. Again, I think there's some things we could probably do differently in the future, um, and hopefully we're learning from, from our steps in the past. How are we doing on time? Is it time for us to go to the audience, or can I ask one more question? Okay, I'm going to assume I have time for one more question. So, I sh actually, I, I have two more questions for you guys. Okay, so the first is, you all have experience um, working in nonprofits in this space. And I'm curious to know, um, you know, in your nonprofit experience, what's the hardest thing to raise money for, and how do you pitch it successfully? I'm just going to take some notes now. <laughs> in our case, one of the, over time, is, is the ongoing programming of public spaces. Uh, you might have people that in the private sector that sign up to do a two or five year agreement, but doing that over the long haul is, is a continuing challenge and continuing to, to show the benefit of that. And I think those that do get involved do see the benefit and uh, are really glad they did it. But uh, sustaining that over time is, with a combination of public and private funds, that's a, that's a challenge over time. Bob, what about you? Well, I, I think my colleague will speak to his parking plan, which he gets a lot of his revenue on. We can't do that. Uh, but I think the, it's, you can get the money to build a lot of these spaces or renovate spaces, getting the capital is, is easier and still hard. I think you can get money for a programming if you can really, you know, strategically and, and carefully do some sponsorships along the way. It's really the, the administration and management and maintenance stuff that really is a tough thing to fund every year. But it's so glamorous. It's totally unglamorous. I mean, if you have a business improvement district, that can help fund some of that. In Detroit, we just got one three years ago. We were late, late to the, the, the table on that. And that funds a very small portion of what we do. So we're constantly pitching, you know, the, the corporations around the, or the businesses, the property owners, the major tenants around the public spaces to make a voluntary uh, uh, gift every year. Every, every year, asked doing the same pitch to help fund these operations, maintenance, and those kinds of things. And it's helping, but also growing earned revenue, uh, which, allowing, again, Steve's organization does a great job at. So the restaurants, the cafes, the food trucks, the rentals, the ice rink, all of that for us now makes money. It took, took, probably took a decade to get to that point. So growing earned revenue is probably the best thing we can do going forward. Fascinating. Steve, tell us more about earned well, revenue. We, we, the, the four spaces, we run the three public spaces, but we also uh, renovated a, a um, auto a cultural facility has a 550 seats theater that we operate and manage as well. Those four spaces cost us about $800,000 a year in the negative. So the 3CDC parent budget of nine and a half million dollars absorbs $800,000 of that. And that assumes that we are getting about a million and a half dollars a year in sponsorships. So long term, that's not sustainable. Uh, long term, we envision that there will be 
um, that we can be a loss leader, that, that we can sustain. It might be at, at a, about a half that level. Um, and we need to get that down, whether it's through some contribution to the uh, improvement district or through additional sponsorships. We're getting now that we're driving so much traffic that our traditional givers of Macy's and Kroger and Procter and Gamble don't have to rely on them be so much because there's people that want in front of our audiences, want in front of the number of people. So we are selling, people are coming to us. I mean, we park two million cars a year in our parking garages. They want to get access to, those, to that information. So the more and more uh, that we can be enterprising in that area to help offset that $800,000 a year um, obviously is going to be important to us because, again, we can't, we can't get enough developer fees, make enough loans, uh, get enough rent to, to offset that annually and that long term that we've, we've got to work that out. But we will not sacrifice the quality of those spaces. That's one thing we have not done. Uh, talking about parking in the long term, though, um, something that I noticed when visiting all of your communities was uh, the significant amount of money, past and present, that is going into building and maintaining structured parking. Um, how's demand for that playing out in your communities, and is that something you see changing in the future? The River City Company, uh, led by Kim White now in Chattanooga, just completed a parking study for Chattanooga to really look at where technology is going with your smartphone and uh, ride sharing apps and um, looking at the parking inventory that we have now and the garages and surface lots and what sort of arrangements could be put in place where new developments could possibly share some of that capacity uh, so that right, there, there's an emerging trend where some of the newer buildings and adaptive reuse have come online and have zero parking spaces with those projects and they're either sharing or in some cases people are just taking public transit or just walking to work. So we're on the very front end of, of that trend and, and River City's on the forefront of and Carta and others looking at the whole, the whole parking picture and, and, and they went block by block, garage by garage to look at, uh, you know, perhaps an office building might be able to share its capacity at nights and weekends with a hotel development and that parking companies can, can then become, uh, uh, they can allocate spaces in valet and, and multiple places all over the city. So the, the whole idea of sharing parking facilities is one that we're just really beginning to really get into in the Chattanooga area. Yeah, and Bob, Detroit probably has some cars. We had, I mean, we're the Motor City, but we had, I mean, had downtown at one point, 150,000 people, had all this retail, how did people get there? They took buses, they took streetcars, and they took trains. That's all went away in the 50s and 60s, and so now we're back, building that population back up downtown, and we're having a parking crisis, mostly during the day. I mean, we built a lot of, a lot of garages got built, but the parking during the day is, is mo mostly sold out, so but we're seeing a lot of shared parking now. We're seeing the residents that are moving into the conversion of these old buildings into lofts and apartments. They now work downtown. They live downtown. So you only need one parking spot. You don't need two spots. So we're seeing a lot of shared parking arrangements going on now. And I think you're seeing a lot of shuttles. And we have our new streetcar system. So it's not just downtown. It's our, our adjacent midtown area that has parking issues. But I think that having shuttles, having our streetcar, uh, having more off-site lots being built, I think, and having shared 24-7 shared kinds of garages is starting to ease up, not so much during the day yet, but certainly evenings and weekends. Um, we have about 4,000 spaces that we've developed, um, either renovated or developed, and um, we operate them like we operate our civic spaces. They are totally managed so that we're turning spaces during the day. We turn them over for events at night. Uh, residents obviously uh, pose a different issue for our parking than office and the ability to um, complement evening parkers with residents is a little bit more complicated, although you'd be shocked at how many people actually, you know, may live in a neighborhood but drive somewhere else to work and, and actually do move their car during the course of the day. Um, we've taken this down to a science from our equipment. Um, we also know two things we've done. Um, in the case of where the big demand is, is in Washington and over the Rhine, we are not really going to increase Park. First of all, you can't because you physically can't knock down historic buildings with parking. And the, and the ones that we, uh, garages that we do have, we've now started uh, essentially valeting cars. So people come in and where we have a 450 car gar garage, we may have 600 monthly leases and we may park 
550 cars in that garage at a given at any one time because we're we're stacking cars in there. And is Cincinnati ready for valet garage? Can they understand that they're they're parking in Manhattan? Yeah, we park in valet garages. We park them there. We do we're going to do it down. We do it downtown too. All right. So um, we that's what you have to do. Use your existing space. In the case of 8451, where we built a um, a thousand car garage with retail and then 300,000 square office above. The three stories above the retail, there's three stories below, three stories above. We built the above three stories of retail um, in, in such a height and, is, um, and such openings that the office, the, the office that built the 300,000 square feet can go into that space immediately. So their expansion space is the garage. We built it anticipating that and they are about after opening for three years, they're about to take another 74,000 square feet in the next level of the garage. They're down. just eating the garage. They're <laughs> eating the garage. Okay. And we want, what we won't do is then build any more parking because we can stack that garage as well. So um, we're managing it. I don't know where parking is going. We've got a lot of invested in parking. You could probably retire and do something else if you did now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> we could do that. But, you know, I think we've already seen the hit of Uber and know what that implication is. And now the question is, where's, where's driverless cars going to take okay. us? Let's be inclusive and open it up to the community. <laughs> and I'd just like to ask everyone, when you ask a question, can you let us know who you are? We want to hear your names and what you do, too. Um, I, is this on? Yes. OK. My name is Marlene Connors, and I'm interested in urban planning and have been all my life. Um, I have a question piggybacking on what you said about parking. Have any of you looked into bike sharing as a possibility with a new demographic moving into the urban centers? Bob, yeah. let's take it to you. All right. So, so one year ago, we launched a new bike share program, you know, following New York and Toronto and all these other places. So it's been tremendous. I mean, in one year, we exceeded all our expectations. It's called MOGO, so for the Motor City. Uh, so it's now we have about 450 bikes, and our goal is to probably double that again in another year. So it has truly become kind of the, in many ways the last mile in terms of people, you know, parking remotely or even if they're going to go just work around downtown. And just real quick, one thing I wanted to say too, in terms of parking, we five years ago we we're planning all this residential downtown and thought every every residential building had to have a garage next to it. And that, you know, now with all the activation on the streets and all the people on the streets now, people, that's not necessary anymore. We're concerned about safety. People will now walk blocks and blocks and blocks with their parking, which is a great thing to have, too, as well. And, I mean, just to answer the question, Chattanooga has bike share as well, and so does Cincinnati. Yeah. It's, it's hot right now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I asked Mark Mallory about this, former mayor of Cincinnati, and he said, uh, you know, he doesn't, he's not personally a bike share user, but he said, um, bike share, you got to have it. It's just one of those things you got to have. It's actually, you know, it's, I use the bike, red bike, and it, it's probably more convenient, I hate to say this, Chris, than the streetcar. Like, if I'm going to a meeting downtown from yeah. over the Rhine, I jump on the red bike. It's you heard it here first, folks. Steve Leeper jumps on the red bike. Okay, next question. Uh, my name is Neil Pierce. I'm a journalist, and I spent about 20 or 30, maybe 40 years traveling America and writing books and newspaper columns. So it's terrific to hear the extent of imagination and progress that has gone into cities over the years. But I have sort of a fundamental question. Why couldn't or shouldn't city councils and city governments have undertaken all these functions? I think well, in certain cities, I think they have. I mean, I think, I mean, I'm just, I would think, like, I just think immediately comes to mind the city of Charleston. I mean, you had a dynamic mayor there that did a wonderful job leading that way. So I, mean, I think that's one case where a city, a city mayor and a council was on the very leading edge of these kinds of initiatives. Yeah, and I think actually it'll be interesting to hear from you guys too. So um, Steve, can we jump to you really quick and can you comment on the city's role in the creation of 3CDC? Yeah, well, the city actually, the then mayor Charlie Lucan and the head of the, the, the largest bank, Fifth Third Bank, made the recommendation to essentially take over the re what would be a redevelopment authority's functions in many way. Um, and I think there was a void there. Uh, a lot of it's created by the fact that Cincinnati is a weak mayor form of government. It is the home of the city manager form of government. That's where it started. 
And as a result, I think it, 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 that has led to some reasons why a, a private sector driven effort could be more effective. Uh, you know, I, I came from a city before this, Pittsburgh, when you had a mayor like Tom Murphy who was driving everything every day. Um, and it was much more aggressive on how it went, it had a much stronger mayor form of government. And I think it depends on situations, leadership, the moment in time that, uh, you know, there was, we were so down and out, they wanted something in Cincinnati. So I'm not so sure there's a cookie cutter answer to that. I think it depends on set of circumstances, leadership, and um, what's, what's uh, going on in that community at that point in time. And Bob, do you want to comment on Detroit's circumstances? <laughs> I don't want to comment on all various mayors, but I have to tell you that the, in, in 2000, uh, we had a Mayor Dennis Archer at the time, and he really it was a bridge between Coleman Young, who was a mayor for over 20 years in Detroit, and, and the other mayor who went to jail. We won't mention his name. Uh, but the, I mean, he challenged a lot of us. I mean, they didn't have the team. They didn't have the planning department. We had an economic growth, Detroit Economic Growth Corporation, which is a pretty good organization, but the planning department was maybe with 10 people or something. I don't know. It was not very many. He challenged us at the time to build the best public space in the world uh, with Campus Martius, and we all thought that's crazy, you know, back in Detroit at that time. But it was his challenge, but he didn't have the team to actually do it. And so it really became the private sector in terms of our nonprofit organization to really put the team together to do it. But the, you can't do these projects without the city being right there with you, the city, the mayor's office, city council. Our current mayor, Mayor Duggan, now is, is totally different in terms of he's building up his planning department again. He's building up his economic development team again. He's building up his jobs team. And so he's, this, the whole scenario was changing in many ways. A lot of the planning that we, we did or have done is now somewhat shifting back to the city, which is a good thing. And so now it's more of about the partnership as opposed to this organization is doing that and this organization is doing that. They don't talk to each other. So, but that's unique in many cities. You know, so we have some friends out in LA. They're trying to redo Pershing Square, and they still have difficulties getting the city, the city council, to work with the private sector to let's redo Pershing Square in the right way. And our, if I may say one more thing, we have in our particular case in Chattanooga, we had very dynamic private leadership that then transitioned to very dynamic public leadership with Mayor John Kinsey and then Mayor Bob Corker. So we, we had a balance of both. We had, uh, you know, at the time in the, in the mid-'80s, uh, very dynamic, uh, visionary private leadership. And thankfully, uh, then John Kinsey and then Bob Corker came along and took it to a whole new level. And this is something we discuss in greater detail in the paper, that there are some inherent trade-offs between the agility, the flexibility, and the focus of a private catalytic developer and a city's need to you know, maybe spread peanut butter over the whole piece of toast uh, for those of us who eat peanut butter on toast, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and to, and to make sure that they're touching um, every part of a jurisdiction um, instead of just uh, concentrating investment in one place. Um, that may just be an inherent conflict. Let's get one more question. Can we kind of head back uh, over to this side? Uh, infrastructure question. Uh, Chattanooga has a nice benefit of fiber optic high-speed internet. How has that been leveraged and used in the... Well, it's really become one of the hallmarks of the city. It's a fascinating story. For those of you all that may not know it, I'm sure you could Google it. Uh, our local electric distributor, the Electric Power Board, has some visionary leadership to uh, put some fiber in the ground. And long story short, I'm just boiling all this down, wound up having the fastest internet uh, in the world, in, of all places, Chattanooga, Tennessee. So uh, a lot of the uh, mayoral leadership this goes back to, again, to uh, Mayor Bob Corker and uh, former Mayor John Kinsey's on the board, Electric Power Board, and private sector leaders and, and philanthropic foundations are all sitting at the same table and have been for about five or eight years looking at how to leverage the world's fastest internet and what kinds of businesses and industries and public benefit can come of that. Schools, uh, government, and new private investment to come into the city. So that's been a, uh, one of the nicknames for Chattanooga now is Gig City, because of gigabit delivery. Um, so that's been one of the, um, the, the, one of the things we've been working a lot on in the last oh, eight or 10 years is, is leveraging that and uh, to try to have new public investment and public benefit from that. To, and, and even to, to have you know, fiber to the homes and lots of internet in the home initiatives to benefit those that may not have uh, internet in their homes to push that out to all, like you said, to spread the peanut butter evenly over the toast. 
that's one of the initiatives going on with the uh, internet service that we have in Chattanooga. Bob, I bet that's ringing some bells in Detroit. It's ringing some bells. I don't know whether we're faster in Chattanooga or not, but we're pretty. But now with Dan Gilbert, I mean, he just invented a, a fiber company called Rocket Fiber now. So, so again, of all the jobs that he's brought downtown Detroit, where it's thirteen thousand jobs plus another five or six thousand mm -hmm. ones that came after him. I mean, they're all tech and finance related, so they need the high speed, they need the latest, and so that's really the growth modem for, for downtown Detroit is tech and finance jobs, and so you have to have this to be competitive. Steve, do you though? Um, I think you need to have, I, I think it's a matter of degree <laughs> and, and whether or not you need it, uh, depending on the type of employment you have, but you know, I, I don't think we are up to speed with either one of your two cities. Uh, but certainly, I think it's, I, we've never seen that as an impediment. Do we have time for more questions? Okay, okay we're going to have one more. I see some questions in the back. Let's get a shout out to the back. <laughs> uh, well, thank you for sharing your peak experience, I assume. Uh, I'm Eagles Milbergs. I'm a co founder of a nonprofit in Seattle that works on clean water. My question is about sustainability, uh, resilience. Uh, I, I, I'd be interested in your insights on what climate change and uh, issues like stormwater, uh, for example, and how to manage water, et cetera, are going to impact urban design. And uh, uh, it seems like these issues are not being managed very well. We have a lot of flooding and drought situations and other kinds of sewage problems, et cetera. Is this a concern that you have, and where do you think this is all going uh, in the future for urban design? That's a big question. And I kind of wish we had our designer on the stage right now. <laughs> <laughs> Just yeah. Up and down. <laughs> well, we, I'm sorry, guys, I want to hear your answers to this, but Duke, I think we need to call yeah, you Duke, back to Duke the stage real quick. Just Duke to handle, hear. Yeah. This Duke, is all you, brother. Duke, well, Duke, please stand up, just in case you guys didn't know. Duke is. I heard architect. earlier our careers were going this way. Maybe there's a chance we can rise up. With <laughs> it's funny you should mention droughts. This guy's from Arizona. Yeah, you, you know. Uh, You've got to take these things into account, and I'm not going to toot ASU's horn too much. We started the first school of sustainability, but I've brought a lot of cities together. And if you look at the southern tier of the U.S. where we are, we are on the front lines of climate change, whether you've got way too much water in the Gulf or too little in, in the desert areas, Southern California, Arizona. Failure to attend to those is not a possibility. And getting, getting cities involved with universities, we have some incredible transformations, let's say, in the recycling of waste, which we've all got a problem with that, and turning that into entrepreneurial opportunities, or in our case, heat island effects. It's going to be a major initiative for us, not to mention water, which, of course, uh, is, a, is a topic of great concern. Uh, you've just got to have these in your development projects, in your city development projects, what your universities are focused on, top of mind. It just has to be. And it is going to change the form of cities, the, the shape of cities, how streets are organized, buildings are organized. It has to change. It will change. Great answer, Duke. And I just want to say also that, side note, I, I will have a post running on Greater Greater Washington today about stormwater management and flood resiliency <laughs> in the D.C. area, where we have had several floods recently. And I think that this is a huge topic, not just in terms of design at the building level, but in terms of thinking regionally and starting to be more smart and efficient about um, where we're putting growth. Because we need to be more realistic about how to raise the money in order to build the kinds of infrastructure adaptations that we will need to survive climate change. And uh, you cannot just find that money uh, growing on trees. It's not, it's not going to fall from the sky. Uh, actually, just more rain will. Yeah. And, and realistically, that means that we need to be um, really more disciplined about creating financially productive, walkable urban places that can raise the revenue to create these infrastructure solutions. Should we wrap it? All right. Thank you so much, guys. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.